Some of the best sporting teams consist of a group of unique characters. That couldn't have been more true for the Glenorchy Cricket Club when they broke a 36-year premiership drought. Slice the oranges, rub in the deep heat and strap yourself in for a great sports story. Welcome to One Week at a Time. Jeeves, you grew up in Glenorchy. Tell us a bit about the community itself. Growing up in, in Claremont, Glenorchy, the northern suburbs, it came with its challenges. We, you know, we, we're known as the Bogans and the Savages and uh, we are that part of town. But um, I think in, in many regards, from a sporting perspective too, it actually helps uh, create a little bit of, well, a little bit of fear at times as well, if you're able to harness that the right way. I know the footy club across an, ex an extended period of time have been able to do that well. And certainly for a, for a period of time, we're able to harness that with the cricket club as well. Talk us through the experience of playing at the highest level and obviously what that meant to you. And Yeah, I mean, play, playing at the high, highest level was, you know, it was a bit of a dream and I had to pinch myself plenty of times. Certainly coming in when I did in the year 2000, cricket didn't have that financial appeal. And, and for everyone that, that was representing that they did it out of straight love of the game. And for me, and, and I, I think that a whole host of uh, other Tasmanians who were in and around that time, it was about the representation of your family or your region or, or, the, or the broader state. It actually meant an enormous amount to be state versus state and, and, and to be a part of that. I was happy playing for Tassie. That, that was dream enough for me. Anything addition, additional to that was, yeah, just cream. So to be able to, uh, you know, get a one day cap that my kids stole. Uh, it's in someone's bedroom <laughs> somewhere. Yeah, it's, it, it, it is now really special to reflect and, and see what it means to my kids, you know, and, and, and the pride they get in, in wearing my cap around the house and in the backyard. It's, yeah, it's pretty cool. Tell us about coming back to Glenorchy and were you aware of the, dr the premiership drought and was that a part of your desire to come back? Yeah, certainly aware of the drought. I mean, I've, I've always been a, a, a passionate and loyal Glenorchy cricket person and um, we, we've had some years where it's been bare bones, you know, we, we finished stone cold last and had terrible seasons and there was an extended period there where, you know, I guess you could say we we're a bit of a laughing stock from a performance standpoint. Prior to that, we'd, we'd had periods of success, you know, we won in the early 2000s, we won a couple of one day flags with a really young team and then that young team kind of disbanded and, you know, we lost some guys to, to country cricket and life and we had to reset a little bit. So when, when I came back, well, I'd retired from professional cricket with some, some back stuff and I'd always wanted to, to coach and to captain and to field at second slip and bat at four and bold, dirty off spin because, <laughs> you know, I didn't get the chance to do any of that as a pro. I filled the fine leg and opened the bowling and batted at eight. And I, I kind of wanted to prove to myself, you know, I think and, and, and to some others that I was a capable leader and a, and a good coach and, and I was someone that that could lead a, a team. Tell us a little bit about GZ. Like, what was the feeling around a club when he came back? He loves this place. Even if you're not best mates off the field, on the field, he'll just go to war. He's a very, come with me, boys. I'll show you how it's done. Obviously, the name of Stand after someone's pretty large. In terms of uh, that year in particular, 2012 13, did you sort of know you had? the capability to win or was it purely unexpected from the start? We had no one who was a star, like no one that was even on the radar of Cricket Taz for any kind of squads or outside of Jeeva, Butsy, maybe one other guy. We were just all a pack of misfits. When I looked at the list, um, very young in, in that year, uh, a lot of upside, but probably a group that hadn't been taught the game in a manner that was going to help them develop. So. They, Everyone had great hand-eye coordination, but no technique. And, and we were hopeful that we could improve. Uh, we had no expectation of winning games or, or making an impact. I remember sitting down there in a big circle. There was about 20 blokes before round one and Jeeva was just like, we're buying in. We're sitting here right now. Everyone's got to buy into this season. We're going to go nowhere. If you want to go and chase cash in the bottom league, if you want to go take 20 year end, do it. But if you stay and you're buying in. And then from that moment, it just clicked. We, we just got hot, you know, we, we won some early games and we just rode this momentum the entire season um, and ended up winning a, a premiership and I think still to this day people look at the, 
look at that team shot, you know, and it's like the Sandlot kids or a Disney movie, you know, there's that, the, the grizzly old pro and, uh, you know, there's a fat kid and a sick kid and, you know, so it's got the dynamic of this kind of fairy tale movie in a sense and I still look at the team, I'm like, you know, it's, it's special. Now, we've heard a lot about Kelby Pickering through various sources and we've heard stories and, and myths and we've heard he's brought, he used to bring pregnant goats to games. And <laughs> have you got a couple of stories that come to mind that yeah, make I you mean, chuckle? The, the goat is just, you know, from a whole different planet. Just they would literally sit on the back of the ute just chewing hay the whole game. He'd ship it up to the games and it'd be, you know, goating its way through the day and there'd be <laughs> shit everywhere. And it's just like, and the car became a wreck because it was, you know, it had been goated. I think. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, you know, b bizarre sort of stuff. He'd roll in to training with a pair of spikes and this four litre orange juice container, no label on it. I reckon they're the same one for five years, just full of water. <laughs> Sit it in the sun, like, Ridiculous. Um, he'd come to the game, wash and basket with his whites and his box. Use everyone else's gear. <laughs> oh, it was next level. I love picks that much to the point where I now wear his number. He was number one. So then I demanded his number when he retired, but he was a warrior. He could bowl to Ricky Ponting, got him out. He'd scream in his face. He could bowl to a third grader, scream in his face if he got him out. You know, some vision. Um, I think did the rounds on social media of, of that final in the first year. Uh, Kelby was just ramped. Him and Matty Johnson had been going at each other in, in the first innings. And Matty Johnson, com combative player, super hitter of the ball, great hand eye. He absolutely slammed one and I took a catch. And the carry on from Kelby was like nothing you've ever seen. <laughs> like... the most guttural roar and, and fist pump and <laughs> to the point where it was almost a little embarrassing. <laughs> I sort of, yeah, I'm all for carry on, but this this went to another level and uh, I absolutely loved it. And then I think you got Hamish Kingston out the very next ball. <laughs> he's running around with the, the ape nuts and like he's just doing his thing. And, um, you know, they're, they're the stories for me though. I, when I think about Kelby, it's the passion, the competitiveness but the execution as well. And, and at that point, people forget, he was 36 or 37 years old. Yeah, hanging on, bare bones, his back, his hand, everything was cooked. Um, didn't whinge once, turned up and trained, uh, really led by example, just a, an unbelievable teammate and a, a great human. People often talk about, you know, the the five minutes after you win in sport being the, you know, the best part of playing sport. And, you know, it's 36 year drought. How was that night at the club with you know, people that have been involved for 20, 30 years and, and what it meant to you? Yeah, it was pretty surreal. Our, our, our second grade team won a premiership that year as well with an even younger team. And, and, and that, that was the great thing about that year um, was that whilst our first grade team felt that success with a young team, the second grade team had gone through the same thing. Probably one of the, the best things I've ever been a part of just the camaraderie. We had a premiership reunion last year, actually. And there's guys strolling you hadn't seen for years. It's just like a brotherhood. By far the, the most special cricketing moment I've had and celebrations here were, were special. And you spoke about the five minutes after when I had to hide, I was just, I didn't really know how to feel or how to react and um, just kind of needed the moment to like take stock of what we'd just actually done. I remember getting a phone call from Kel Coburn, who's one of the, the all-time legends um, of our club, someone I've always respected and, and admired, rang me on the Monday, you know, kind of just in tears. You know, he's, he's like, you don't understand what this means to people. Um, I had to pull the car over because I, <laughs> I was a little emotional myself. But yeah, it's, it's, it's little moments like that where, you know, it, it kind of it kicks in that you've, you know, whilst many people say, well, it's club sport, um, you know, to, to me, club sport is, is as special as pro sport because of what clubs are capable of doing for the community. You know, we spoke before about the opportunities for young people in employment and mentorship and, and, and leadership, um, behavioural standards. Um, you know, sporting clubs are, uh, are, are a perfect platform for the growth of humans. In the ops side, like, 
How you go running a club in terms of like the fundraising and um, you know just keeping a club afloat. So since cricket clubs are so small, you just have to rely on sponsors. Um, we're very lucky this year to pick up four or five pretty good sponsors that we've never had. Um, without the support of those guys that are just local community businesses, you wouldn't be afloat. What do you hope for the future of Glenorchy Cricket Club? Do you still want to be involved in some capacity? Yeah, or what do you yeah. Say yeah. So I'm I'm still loosely involved in my boys are 12, 9, and 7 at the moment and are sports mad themselves. So um, I'm not as involved as as I as I was, but um, you know it kind of it runs through my blood a little bit. It's it's in me and it always has been, and so I'll, I'll always be around in in some capacity. And what I want for the club is for for them to. You know, hopefully in, enjoy the same success that, that, that we had during that time, but also to use the, those standards and some of the behaviours and, and, and the expectations that we built within those players to, to take ownership of, of, of their own games. I, I've, I've always been you know, really well connected and proud of my involvement in Glenorchy and yeah, to, to be involved in, in breaking that drought. Um, with the group of guys that we did and the, the perceptions and the expectation on us that, that year, yeah, it, was, it was beyond amazing. The Glenorchy Cricket Club story is proudly brought to you by Aussie Broadband's Helping Communities Connect program. An easy way to save money for your club with a discounted internet connection on Aussie's award-winning network and access to other fundraising opportunities. You can apply on behalf of your organisation by searching Helping Communities Connect on the Aussie Broadband website and sign up online. Or you can give the friendly Aussie-based team a call. Hopefully, we'll be telling your club story soon.